then, everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. to the martial arts at Avatar The Last Airbender. Sorry, I had to like run backstage. I left my phone on the wrong side of the room. Um, this is arguably, factually, one of the best animated TV shows. There's that one. Of course. And what makes it even better is that the bending styles and the fighting styles you see in the show were taken from actual martial arts from Chinese history. Things like traditional kung fu, animal styles, even modern day wushu that you're gonna see all of us doing up here today. It all stems from history and it's lovely. We are the Dragon Phoenix Wushu team, a martial arts team at The Ohio State University. We specialize in modern competitive wushu. We also have a few people doing traditional styles, many different weapons, you name it, we probably do it, I'm sure. If this is your first time at our panel, as we posted this in the past, Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking time out of your afternoon to join us. If this is not your first time, welcome back. We always love when you come back. In addition to demonstrating the bending styles seen in the show, we'll also demonstrate lots of the weapons you see, such as fans, broadswords, stabs, spears, lots of sharp, pointy, loud noise, snaking things. It'll be lovely. If you pay attention and remember some of what we talk about when we're discussing the history and the martial arts up here, we have fun prizes and a fun trivia game later at the end. So you just stick around for that. This just helps us know that you paid attention, you know. The entire team has worked really hard for this panel for the past month or two. Um, we're very excited to show you what we've got. Some of us have many years of training, some of us just started. But no matter how experienced you are in performing or in martial arts or in anything, doing it in front of a large group of wonderful people like yourselves is exciting and also very nerve-wracking. So, while we're up here doing our stuff, if you see something you like, you see something you think is cool, or you just feel like yelling, I guess, please cheer us on. We would love to hear you yelling and encouraging us. It really pumps us up. All right, <laughs> lastly. <laughs> Thank you, I'm not done. <laughs> Lastly, if you're interested in learning martial arts, learning more about Wushu, or maybe you just want to talk about Avatar, what we did, you want to tell us that we're cool and we're like the greatest thing you've ever seen, or maybe you want to talk about how cold it is outside, um, you know, oh my gosh, how about that movie? I don't know. We're, we're here to chat at the end, so feel free to come talk with us. We would love to chit chat and get to know you guys. We'll also be hosting a workshop this evening at 9.30 p.m late hours, I know. It sounds like you guys slept in late, so maybe you're all night owls. Um, but we're hosting a workshop where we'll go over some of the stuff we do at this panel, actually. So you get to do some of the stuff from Avatar yourselves. It's very fun, personally, I think so. So, thank you very much for being here, and without further ado, let's begin at the beginning of the Avatar cycle with water. First up, we have Catherine and Michelle demonstrating the martial art that inspired waterbending, the young style of Tai Chi Chuen, 
A Chinese martial art that emphasizes slow, controlled, and elegant movement. Managing one's breath and energy, or qi, is very important to this discipline. Sparring in Tai Chi is not a contest of strength. Sometimes referred to as push hands, this type of fighting emphasizes creating circles of energy uh, to redirect one's opponent and knock them off balance. Known as a healing art, Tai Chi is also used as a form of physical therapy for the injured and elder. Uh, tai Chi is less about strength and more about alignment, body structure, breath, and visualization. Next up, we have Mao demonstrating Chen Tai Chi. Mao! <laughs> Did you though? I did. No, you didn't. Establishing Hunga or Hung family Kung Fu. Now, there's one bird bender whose exception are a lovable blind bandit Toph. Her style is based more on Southern Mantis. This is a style common and popular among the Hakka people of Southern China. Uh, it's different from Hunga in that it's much more aggressive, arms always extended forward for quick strikes, and a more focused on constant movement and neutral gene. Both forms rely on connection to the earth. So Stephen and myself will be demonstrating Sunny Mantis and Honga respectively.
I'm short. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Mel, and I'm here to talk to you about fire vending. Uh, behind, behind me, I've got uh, Steven and Ryan demonstrating some fire bending moves. Fire bending is an explosive, aggressive, and dynamic style focused on driving one's energy through an opponent. Students are often taught to imagine their strikes penetrating forward for a thousand miles in order to achieve enough force in their forms. Shaolin Kung Fu's origins date back to 527 AD. Being one of the oldest styles of martial arts in the world, many other disciplines were built on its principles. Breath control is extremely important in this style. The practitioner must learn to regulate their stamina throughout many energy intensive movements. Sweeps, high kicks, and swift punches are characteristic of this style. Northern styles of Kung Fu emphasize quick advances and retreats, kicking and leaping techniques, circular blocks, and agility. The priority is on offense rather than defense, and this can be seen in the series when firebenders must rely only on their dexterity to save them from an incoming air gust or lash of water. Not only do firebenders use their hands to direct flames at their opponents, but they also use their feet to lash out and propel themselves upward. The firebenders in the series, namely Zuko and later Azula, can be seen using very fierce strong punches and kicks, as well as acrobatic movements. These are the key components of Northern Shaolin Kung Fu. And next we have Hansen demonstrating a Shaolin form. the martial art for which airbending is heavily modeled after, called Bagua Zhang, or Bagua for short. The creation of Bagua is attributed to Dong Hai Chuan and is believed to be originated from the teachings of Taoist monks provided to him in the early 1800s. The term Bagua refers to a set of eight symbols used in Taoist cosmology to represent the fundamental principles of reality. These symbols may belong to the forces of yin or yang, which are believed to organize material energy from which life is born. Bagua belongs to the Wudang School of Chinese Martial Arts, which also hosts Tai Chi and Jing Yi Chuan. As an internal martial art, it emphasizes qi building, meditation, and spiritual well-being. Bagua is also known as circle walking, a core element of the martial art, in which the fighter must be constantly moving to avoid attack. The twists and turns used within Bagua are believed to amplify or change the fighter's qi and the meditative stance is said to control it and draw additional energy from the surrounding atmosphere. One must have strong direction to control their momentum and power in order to effectively utilize this art. Circle walking also aims to train both the mind and body outside of combat. Practitioners may meditate, gather chi, or review forms while traveling in a circle. The style of walking also depends on the goals and temperament of the walker. 
Walk simply slow and in a grounded squat or fast while heavily relying on your twinkle toes. Avatar's iconic A utilizes Bagua Zhang and his air running techniques to fight multiple opponents without the need for brute strength. An example of this was in the battleship fight against the Grand troops, where it dodged and shifted around his opponent so that he not be directly attacked. Up next, we have Edward, who will be demonstrating a Bagua Dog. <laughs> Chinese weapons because of its historical development and its relation to other weapons. After the development of metalworking, the staff became the basis of a number of other weapons, such as the two and three section staffs, the spear, the halberd, and a number of other pole arms. In the show, staffs were used by the airbenders as part of their airbending techniques. They were used to direct blasts of air at their opponents, at the environment, and combined with airbending, they use it to fly. Now, our staffs do not double as gliders as the airbender staffs do, nor can we actually fly, but we do hope you'll enjoy our demonstration. Next, Jeff and I will be demonstrating the Chinese staff.
This is a fantastic hike for me, guys. <laughs> They're laughing at me. You just can't see them in the wings. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Catherine, and today I'm going to be talking about the fans, or the Kyoshi Warriors. So the Kyoshi Warriors are most known for the use of a fan, more specifically a metal-plated fan known as a tessin. The main fan form performed by the Kyoshi Warriors is known as tessin jutsu, a mar Japanese martial art that uses an iron fan. Traditionally, they use iron fans that open like bamboo fans today. Although, uh, sorry, although they would also have a weapon that was closed, like a, a shaped like a closed fan, uh, made of solid iron for close range combat. Tessin Jutsu is practiced by a few experts in Japan today, and it is relatively rare to find a, t a school teaching Tessin Jutsu, especially in the US. A legendary Japanese hero, Minamoto no Yoshitsune, was said to have blocked sword and spear attacks with his Tessin and was taught tessin jutsu and swordmanship by a mythological Japanese creature called a tengu. Fans in both tessin jutsu and wushu are generally, uh, are generally used use it as a defensive weapon that can be used for disarming opponents. Fans are mostly used for blocking opposing attacks, which pairs well with another technique used by the Kyoshi warriors called Aikido, a form based on joint locks, throws, and rolls. Nowadays, wushu fan forms have become more performative, and performers will sometimes spin and flip their fans into the air and will use quick snapping motions and jumps. Michelle and I will be performing, and I hope you all are fans of our fan form. <laughs> <laughs> talk about the straight sword, or the jin, as they say in Mandarin Chinese. The straight sword is a double-edged blade, unlike another sword you will see, the broad sword. Um, in Chinese folklore and history, the straight sword was considered to be a gentleman's weapon. It was mostly used by officers of the military, high-ranking officials, you know, the elite cool people. Um, historically, the straight sword was used on the battlefield, but today most are flexible and mainly used for ceremony or, or performance purposes and not for actual combat. In Avatar, uh, specifically, we see Pian Dao, a Fire Nation swordmaster, as he teaches Sokka how to master the straight sword. That's towards the end of season three. Um, today, the straight sword is very closely tied with Tai Chi or Tai Chi Jian, Tai Chi straight sword. And there are more than 32 Tai Chi forms that use this weapon. It's very popular. We can see that although Pian Dao is from the Fire Nation, he trained Sokka in a weapon that would best reflect his water tribe culture and incorporate the movements of Tai Chi that related and mirrored waterbending. Please enjoy as Mao demonstrates some Tai Chi Jian, and I perform a modern Wushu version of the straight sword.
All right, hello everybody. My name is Hanson, and I'm going to be talking to you all about uh, the, the broadsword, the Chinese broadsword, also known as the doll. Uh, the doll is one of the most commonly seen weapons in martial arts, um, the fitting of its title, the General of Weapons. While the doll has been around for centuries, uh, some of their features have remained consistent. The blade is curved and possesses a single cutting edge. This is because the doll are commonly and primarily a slashing and chopping weapon as opposed to stabbing. Oftentimes the hilt or handle is also curved, but in the opposite direction. This aids in the uh, handling of the weapon. Older forms of the broadsword used to have lanyards attached through holes in the hilt to, per, uh, to further aid in control and maneuverability. But the types that are used nowadays instead have tassels or scarves, as you see with our uh, showcases here. <laughs> Most of the time, broadswords are used as a single, one-handed weapon. However, we, speak, we primarily see it in Avatar used as a dual weapon. Prince Zuko, also known as the Moon, uh, oh, sorry, the Blue Spirit, was uh, demonstrating his mastery of the double broadsword on many occasions, using it to defend, attack, and most importantly, as an extension of his body and his fire memory. And now, here is a demonstration of a single and double broadsword form by Jeff and Steven, respectively. Also known as the Da Dao, uh, the Green Dragon Crescent Moon Blade, or more simply the Glaive, uh, is the signature weapon of the Chinese god of war, Guan Yu. Now, Guan Yu's weapon weighs over a hundred pounds, reportedly, uh, but mine here only weighs about five, so <laughs> take it or leave it. Uh, throughout history, the Guan Dao was used as a charioteer, cavalry, and anti cavalry weapon as the length of the blade is just long enough to reach from horse to horse, from ground to horse, and from horse to ground. The cutting edge is also 
quite effective at doing its job of creating deep wounds and dismembering limbs. In Avatar, uh, this weapon was used by a member of the Rough Rhinos, uh, who attempted to capture Aang, and was seen commonly among mounted Earth Kingdom soldiers. on stage, so I'd like someone to tell me about the inside joke later. <laughs> Next we're going to be doing the spear, or chang in Chinese. Uh, the spear is very often known as the king of the weapons, not to brag. Um, this is because it's very tall. Um, spears commonly all have this leaf-shaped blade you see at the top, um, a horsehair tassel, which is the red flowing thingies. And then they're usually, they were usually at least two and a half meters tall, which is about eight feet for the members of the audience who are users of the imperial metric system. Um, mine's about seven feet, because I am shorter than that, I guess. The tassel serves many purposes. One being that it shows elite troop status, you know, fancy high-ranking officers, they're cool, they're the baddies. Um, if you move the spear fast enough, the tassels flow along, Along with the flexible portion of the spear, as you see it flopping back and forth, this is used to distract enemies, kind of mess with their vision a little bit, made the spear harder to grab. Um, and one other fun little tidbit is that the tassels usually start out white in color, um, but <laughs> you see where I'm going with this. <laughs> they put the tassel on the spear, to help stop blood from flowing down the entirety of the spear, making it slippery while the blood is wet, or later, when you're done fighting people and you know, you're like, wow, I need to wash my weapons, it will not be sticky because there's no dried blood. We can see spears used quite often in Avatar, um, mostly by a lot of water tribe soldiers, as well as some members of the Fire Nation. Thank you to my lovely assistant, Veronica, and I hope you enjoy my demonstration of the spear.
next, this two-handed version of the broadsword exchanges grace for power and size, the Nandao. The Nandao is a much more modern invention, so unfortunately it is not showcased in the series, but we decided to add it on as a little treat for you guys. Ooh. However, it is a weapon that mixes the expertise of the sword master by Piandao and the roots of Nanquan, the southern style bending scene with the earthbenders earlier. Representing the sword master Piandao is our coach, Brian Cao. Brian is a member of the US Wushu team and has competed all around the world. Uh, we can't thank him enough for his guidance and patience. Take it away.